Hashki Venu Adonai Eloheinu Vishalom Vishalom Shalom and welcome. May these next few minutes be an opportunity to awaken to the truth of your own being, which is the truth of all being and to liberate from constrictedness into the expansiveness of this moment. So let's begin with a question. What would it take for all of your actions, all of your words, all of your thoughts to completely fulfill the purpose of creation right now? And what if the answer to that question is absolutely nothing? Because there is no separate you. There is no choice to be different from the rest of creation. There is, in fact, only one reality and you're not separate from that reality. So how could you possibly ever think or say or do anything that's out of alignment with the purpose of the universe or with the flow or the unfolding of the universe? And if this is true, if there's absolutely nothing you can do that is ever out of alignment with the flow of the universe, then wouldn't it be nice to do it willingly? Wouldn't it be nice to serve the unfolding of creation willingly? Because the paradox is that even though every moment we are not separate from the rest of the universe and so therefore we don't have any individual choice whatsoever in anything that we do. Still, in this moment, there appears to be the choice to either open to that fact or not. So in this moment, there is no separate I, there is no separate me, and yet I always have the choice in this moment to realize that I have no choice in this moment. I have the choice to open to that fact, to relax, to surrender, or to contract and to resist and to be in a state of non-acceptance. It says in the Talmud, everything is in the hands of heaven except fear or awe of heaven. So what does that mean? Everything is in the hands of heaven, meaning that we don't control anything. We have absolutely no control. Why do we not have control? Because there is no separate me to have control. There is just the unfolding, and I am part of that unfolding. And at the same time, it says, everything is in the hands of heaven except the fear of heaven. And by fear, it doesn't mean being afraid that something's going to happen to me. Fear, the word yira in Hebrew for fear, is awe or respect or honoring. So to be in a state of respect for heaven, what is heaven? There's heaven and there's earth. And heaven is just space. It's just empty space. So heaven, in a sense, is nothingness. So to be in awe of heaven is to respect the fact of nothingness. What is that nothingness? Nothingness is what we are. Nothingness is the consciousness within which we become aware of everything that's coming and going in this moment.
And when you respect the nothingness, when you realize that you are nothing, then there's nothing that you need. There's no sense of reaching for anything. There's no sense of incompleteness that needs to be completed by something that you reach for externally. To be nothing is to be free. To accept your nothingness is to be whole and to be content. As Ben Zoma says in Pirkei Avot, who is rich? A person who is content with their portion. And what is our portion? Our portion is nothing. And what are we? We are nothing. So the richness, the true richness, is not the self that is grasping after riches, that is wanting to achieve or accomplish or get. But the true richness is to realize that everything now is complete as it is. And that's our choice in this moment. That's our only choice in a sense. But if that choice is always available to us, if contentment, if peace, if openness is always available, why do we human beings seem to constantly choose the opposite? If it's our choice to be at peace and be content, why do we choose misery? Why do we choose resistance? One reason is that there's often a fear that if we are truly content, if we truly let go, if we're truly free, then we won't be motivated to do anything. And we'll just sit around and do nothing and be useless. But actually the opposite is true. Because when we open to the inner space, the inner nothing, there arises a different motivation, and that's the motivation of love. The motivation of love is not a motivation to get somewhere or to get something or to complete ourselves, but the motivation of love is just the desire to give, just the desire to serve, which is our nature anyway, which is what we're doing anyway. So why not do it willingly? Why not do it intentionally? There's a story of Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev, the Hasidic master, who had completed all 25 hours of fasting, no food, no water, on Yom Kippur. And he had been leading the prayers the whole time, so he had been putting forth great energy and great passion into the prayers with no food and no water for 25 hours and Yom Kippur was over and he retreated into his private study to break his fast with a cup of coffee which was his custom and his disciple Shmuel wanted to go visit him but he waited a little while to give Rabbi Levi Yitzchak a little time to be alone to recuperate a little bit and drink his coffee Eventually, Shmuel comes, he knocks on the door, and he's invited in, and he comes in, and he's surprised to see that the coffee is sitting on the table untouched. And Levi Yitzchak says, Shmuel, my dear, I'm so, so glad that you came to visit me. Come sit down. I couldn't break the fast until I told somebody what happened today. Such an incredible thing that happened. So please, come and sit down. During the prayers, says Rabbi Levi Yitzchak, there was a charge against humanity that was brought in heaven by Hasatan, by the Satan. Satan comes to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, comes to God and says, it's not fair how you're treating human beings. It is uh, too lenient, too compassionate. Because when a person steals a, steals a coin, then you determine the punishment for that person stealing a coin by putting the coin on a scale 
weighing the coin, and according to the weight of the coin, then you punish the person. But when a person gives a coin to somebody in need, then what do you do? You put the person who received the coin on the scale, plus you put all the person's family on the scale who is also benefiting, plus you put the people who may benefit in any way from those people, and so on and so on and so on to infinity. And so the person receiving the reward for giving is completely out of proportion to the person who is stealing the coin. You should make it even. There should be one rule for both. Either you determine the reward for giving by simply weighing the coin, just like you do for the person who's stealing, or when a person steals, you should punish them according to the weight of the person he stole from and all the people who uh, are affected by that and the people who are affected by them and so on and so on. And so at that point, I stepped forward. This is Rabbi Levi Yitzchak talking. He says, I stepped forward in defense of humanity and I said, no, actually, the way it's done is correct. Because when a person gives a coin to somebody, why do they do it? They do it because they, they do it out of love. They care about the person that they're giving to. So it makes sense that you should weigh the person that's benefiting plus all the people that are benefiting from that person. But when a person steals a coin, the person's not interested in the one he's stealing it from. He's only interested in the coin. He's grasping after the coin for himself. So the weight of the coin should be the punishment. Now this is a clever morality tale on one level, but on a deeper level, what does it mean when it says that a person is punished according to the weight of a small coin? In a sense, the punishment is the smallness itself. The coin represents smallness, represents constrictedness. Because when we're grasping after something, when we, the motivation that arises to steal something is one of small, constricted self. The self that believes it is something. And in that somethingness, it's incomplete. It needs another something. The something needs a something. But when we give out of love, the motivation is the opposite. The motivation of love arises from the expansiveness of being nothing. And so the reward is represented by the infinite number of people put on that scale in the sense that there's no sense of limitation of self. It's all about your own sense of beingness. That when you give, when you, when you act out of love, you are reinforcing the seeing of your true nature. You're reinforcing the revelation of what you really are. So let's open to the reality of what you are right now. Becoming aware of what's happening in this moment feeling the flow of your own breathing, opening to everything that your senses are receiving, opening deeply to whatever it is you're feeling, feeling in your heart, feeling in your gut, also opening to the movement of your mind, whatever thoughts are arising. And knowing that all this is happening in the space of consciousness, the space that has no form, that is openness, that is freedom, that is wholeness, and that itself is needing nothing. And isn't this space of consciousness the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of love? The beginning of wisdom is awe of existence. 
Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto Leolam Vaed. Blessed is this glorious moment, expressing the eternal through all that appears and disappears. Amen. Na 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 na